Hello, y'all. Good morning. Good afternoon. Good evening, wherever you are in the world or probably watching this afterward on YouTube. I'm Jeff. I'm one of the maintainers on PyScript. And today, let's talk about everything that's new and exciting in the past couple months of PyScript development. Uh, if you uh, have been on this channel before, you'll know I used to try and do these streams for every single PyScript release, but we've had five releases in the past two months, and on top of that, I moved. Uh, so I'm now playing catch up, and I'm going to introduce everything that's new between PyScript 2024.1.2 and the most current release uh, when I'm filming this, which is 2024.3.2. I'm not going to try and go through every step of evolution that all of these new features made in between those two steps. Um, I'm just going to try and catch you up to what the state of the art is here in early April 2024 as far as PyScript. So I guess without further ado, let's just get into it. Um, let us take our normal PyScript file here, and I'll just, I'll just show you what the framework is. I'm going to hide some of this stuff in a moment, um, but just in case you are brand new to PyScript or maybe you're coming from an alpha or an early version of PyScript, what a typical setup for running PyScript in an HTML page is. Um, I have some boilerplate HTML here in the head just to make things display a little more nicely. You don't need to worry about that. Um, these are the two links you want to worry about. You link to the PyScript script itself. If you're coming from an older version, remember you no longer need it to be a defer type script, but you will need type module. And then the most current release as of filming is at https colon slash slash pyscript.net slash releases slash 2024.3.2 slash core.js. And that will bring PyScript into your page. There's a similar link for the CSS style sheet, which does very little. It helps style the inline editor. It helps hide the configuration flag. Um, include it if it's handy for you. If not, don't worry about it. Um, I'm also in my PyConfig for what it's worth for this video. Um, you don't need to worry about this, but I'm serving PyScript locally um, so that I don't have to reload from the web while I'm streaming every time I refresh the page. And then we'll have our PyScript tag, which is a script with a type of Py and a source pointing to a Python file. In this case, demo.py is just this simple file uh, from PyScript import display and display hello world. And that gives us, oops, get, that gives us our my cheat sheet, which has popped up in a different Chrome window. But if I size it correctly, we get uh, <laughs> well, what's new in PyScript. Uh, we, we get the hello world text there um, popping up from our display function. <laughs> so that's the that's the the 90 second overview of how PyScript gets started. Uh, if you've never touched it before, and if you haven't touched it before, you're in for a cool day. Um, let me hide a couple of these. Uh, tags we don't need to worry about. Um, and let's just start working through the new features that have been released in PyScript recently. Um, one of them, which is really cool, is the ability to have multiple terminals on a page. So as a refresher, um, a terminal is something like this. So if I do, here, let's, so let's do, I'll tell you what, I'm going to get rid of my source attribute for now, just so we can do everything all in this one display. In general, I recommend breaking your Python code out into a separate .py file, because then like VS Code knows how to highlight it and lint it and all that stuff. Um, but for the sake of seeing everything at once, let's just do this all in line. Um, and I will just say print hello world. If I reload that, you'll see we get something that looks a lot like a, like a console you'd see on your desktop, and it prints out in this nice mono space font, hello world, right? And I can do all the things um, that I would normally do in a console. Um, I can print it with lots of text. This is meant to be a useful output format if you are um, dealing with a Python library that is normally outputting to a console, like maybe you're building a textual app or outputting things with Rich or, or something like that. Um, this in-browser console, which is uh, provided by Xterm.js, will function just like your desktop console. So your, your text-based tools should look the same. Um, what it used to be the case that you could only have one of these per page, and that is just no longer true. So if I duplicate this tag uh, and make a second one that says goodbye world, you'll see I now, though they're quite large, maybe I'll shrink that a little bit, um, I now have two worker terminals on my page, one of which is for hello world and one of which is for goodbye world. Um, now, why would I actually want to have two terminals on a page? Well, maybe you're doing a documentation page or you're writing blog posts or something and you want to have output in console format in two different places. That's one option. The option that actually drove this feature request has to do with um, wanting multiple interactive terminals on the page. Um, and as a reminder, uh, uh, let's see, the way you get an interactive REPL in the page is to, in the Python side, do import code and code.interact in your uh, terminal script. I'll do that twice. 
now if I reload, I should see uh, they're still running the code that was before the interact statement, right? So I still get hello world, hello world, goodbye world, goodbye world, etc. But these are two separate and distinct REPLs that are running in the browser. So if I do x equals one in the first REPL and I do x in the second REPL, I get, I should make sure you can see that on the screen. Um, I get an x is not defined error in the second REPL uh, because these are two separate Python interpreters that are working in two separate workers. Um, and so they do not share state. Um, and so this was actually the feature that that drove the development of um, wanting to have multiple terminals. If you're writing an interactive page, you probably you may want multiple distinct REPLs on different parts of the page. And now that is possible um, with uh, PyScript's 2023. 2024.3.2. I'll get it by the end of this. Um, so that's a cool new perk. Speaking of terminals, um, there's another feature of terminals that I want to look at, which actually this this example of it, where it's hard to sort of fit everything on the page is a great example of. So I mentioned a moment ago that um, this is powered by a thing called XTermJS, which is basically a console emulator for the browser. Um, and people are like, well, XTermJS has a lot of like responsivity and I'd like to access its API from within PyScript. How can I... Um, take advantage of the fact that I can modify how XTermJS works without having to like import it separately as a JavaScript module or, or, or something complicated like that. Um, so now that is possible to do directly within uh, PyScript. If you are running code in a terminal, um, PyScript now makes available at the global scope uh, a new variable called Dunder Terminal. Uh, and the Dunder terminal variable, or I guess the Dunder terminal name, points at the XTermJS object itself. Um, so you can use any part of the XTermJS API to interact with the terminal properly. So in this case, I could do, I'm just looking over at my notes here to make sure I get it right. I could do terminal.resize 40 by 6. And that should resize the terminal to be uh, 40 columns uh, wide by six lines tall. Yes, and you can see it's it's taken place on both of those things. Now, what's happened here is because it's automatically fitting, to, <laughs> it's fitting to six lines. You can actually see probably on the side of my screen here, I have two little scroll bars. Maybe I'll make this all bigger again. I have two little scroll bars. Um, so I'm actually having to scroll back up to see the hello world text and scroll back up to see the goodbye world text. Maybe we make those a little bit bigger. Maybe we say... That's eight, eight rows by eight rows. So they're gonna initialize at their full default height, which is a fill setting, basically. Um, they fit to the size of their container. And then when the when the interpreter is loaded and Python kicks in, the first thing it's gonna do is resize that terminal to 40 columns by eight lines. Um, and you can see I'm still a little bit shy. I guess I should probably, let's make this like 12 lines tall and 12 lines tall because I'm getting some text wrapping and that's making it hard to see as well. Yeah. So now I have two different REPLs in the page. And again, if I set X to one in one of them and I uh, oops, zoom a little bit, uh, if I if I ask for X and the other, you see X is not defined because again, these are two separate interpreters. So that's the terminal attribute. If you are looking to uh, interact with the X term JS console itself in a more direct way, you, call, you uh, reach it through Dunder terminal inside of your terminal tag. Piece of cake. Cool. Feel free to ask questions at any time. I'm going to breeze on through, or if you're watching this after the fact, um, feel free to put questions in the comments of this YouTube video. There's also a link in the description of this stream and video to the PyScript Discord, uh, which is a great place to get real-time help with PyScript. I lurk there a lot, as do all of the other core devs. It's actually sort of taken the place of Slack for the dev team. Um, so if you if you have questions about PyScript, uh, that's a great place to find the core devs and a bunch of community members doing cool work. Uh, so come and join us over there. I highly recommend it. Another new feature we've got recently, and this one is I'm, I'm really excited about. This was a very much asked for feature, has to do with Py editors. So if you remember, a Py editor, which was called a Py REPL in early versions of PyScript, but it's not, it's not really a REPL, it's more of an editor field. Um, if you have a script with a type of Py editor, when you load the page, a code mirror, an inline code editor, will be inserted in the HTML at the point uh, of your script tag. Um, with this run button, when you run it, uh, that will run your Python code, uh, and that will uh, execute and display the results to standard out immediately below it. And again, I can, you know, this is this is really honest to goodness Python code um, that I am running in the browser. Uh, the reason there's a little bit of a delay here is each time that you um, 
that you it, uh, run code in a given interpreter, and I'll expand on that in a moment. Anytime you run code in a given interpreter for the first time, Pyodide or your MicroPython runtime initializes them. So in other words, when I load this page for the first time, I'll just make that a little bigger. When I load this page for the first time, uh, we're not bootstrapping our, our Python interpreter right at that moment. We're not bothering to bootstrap it until the moment that the user actually needs to run code. So you'll see if I click to, Three, that's PyDive bootstrapping, and then Python is running. If I have um, multiple editors in the same environment, and this was a feature from early January, but it's worth recapping. If I have multiple editors that share the same underlying interpreter, essentially, which we would call an environment with this env attribute, um, then uh, they are bootstrapped, obviously there's one interpreter behind the scenes that is bootstrapped the first time any of these tags is run. So you'll see both of these editors have the pyodide one uh, indicator by them, showing which environment they're part of. If I run the hello world tag here, you'll see it takes a couple seconds for pyodide to bootstrap. But now if I run the goodbye world tag, it's almost instantaneous because that, that interpreter is already bootstrapped, oops, and ready to go. Um, we do that again just for clarity. So again, so I've just reloaded the page. Pyodide is not uh, initialized in this page. We haven't loaded an interpreter, so the page is loading as fast as it can. If I click two, three, that Pyodide is bootstrapped and run my code. Now the interpreter is warmed up. The WebAssembly is initialized. And when I run my second tag, click, it's almost instantaneous, right? So that's the relationship between multiple editors that share the same environment. And just to expand on that a little bit more, of course, if I had an editor in a different environment, so if I put it in env2 down here, um, in my first editor, I could say x equals one. In my second editor, I could say print x, oh, not with quotes, print x. And in my other environments, I could print X, so I'll load that up. So if I initialize my, if I run my first tag, I should get no output, right? Because this isn't outputting anything. My other, uh, my next Pi editor that's in the same environment, if I run it, should see that value of X and print one. Uh, and then if I run the editor from my second environment, I should get an error. Um, you'll see there's also a little bit of a delay there because again, we have to bootstrap a new interpreter because this is a new environment. And indeed I get an error saying X is not defined because the two environments, the two interpreter is not the same as the one interpreter. Make sense? So this actually leads us to essentially the motivating feature behind a new feature in PyScript as of earlier this year, which is a lot of folks who are using these Py editors on their page, myself included, um, want to do something like this. They want to uh, write it into their documentation, say, uh, in a, maybe a paragraph tag, let's talk about the foo function. And then they want to have an editor. Let's clean this up a little bit. They want to have an editor that displays how the foo function works that the user could run. I could say foo, um, and let's uh, we're gonna we're gonna make up this content in real time. We'll say foo um, os dot lister uh, of the home directory. All right. Let's say we're applying the foo function to some amount of content that's about our operating system. Right. And so. When I have a piece of documentation, this looks great. It says, let's talk about the foo function and it shows an example of use, right? But of course, if I run this, we haven't like, we haven't defined foo anywhere in this actual code. We haven't done anything with an import to make this work. Um, so we're gonna get foo is not defined. So one, what we've had to do prior to this latest feature is basically do all of the necessary coding inside of a pie editor. We have to say, okay, well, um, the foo function, um, takes a string and let's say it just prints that string. Um, then we're gonna need OS, so I'm gonna have to import OS and it's that. Um, so now when I run this function, uh, I should see that we print out the contents of the virtual home directory uh, that exists in memory in the PyDot interpreter. This is not my home directory. I'm actually on a Windows machine right now, so this is very far from my home directory. Um, uh, so this is working, but this is a little bit messy, right? If I have to include this every time I want to just talk about the foo function, this is a little bit verbose. I'd rather just show the user this line and say, here's how you use it. Um, with the new feature in uh, PyScript as of earlier this year, this is now possible with a feature called a setup tag. So if I have a script type equals py editor, env equals one, we want to share the same interpreter, and I give it the setup attribute, 
any code in that, let's call it a setup tag, we don't have a great nomenclature yet, but I've been calling it a setup tag tag uh, will be executed in the interpreter before the first editor of that interpreter runs. So when I click the run button of my editor to initialize this runtime and then run my function, what PyScript will do will is find the setup tag corresponding to that environment on my page, run all this code, you know, in, in the background, so to speak, we'll just run it. Um, and then we'll run the code in that editor. So we should see now, if I run this code, what I get is the same exact result as before, but now my user doesn't have to see all of my various setup code which is great. Um, so now, I, you know, this is great for documentation. This is great for educational uh, functions. Um, you could say, you know, given a, hey student, given a function called foo that takes a string, um, print out that string twice, right? And you could say, um, you know, make your foo function return a string. And then the challenge to your student is to um, say, uh, I don't know, print, uh, foo plus foo, right? And then you're, you're sort of hiding the implementation details. Oh, <laughs> uh, I guess I shouldn't take a parameter there. You're hiding the implementation details from your user, your student, whatever you have by including them in this setup tag. A couple of uh, things to know about the setup tag. Um, you can only have one setup tag per environment on your page. Um, so I believe if I just put some, a second setup tag with some nonsense content in here, let's see if that'll work. Um, if I run this, I believe it will give me, ooh, I thought it would give me an error. Does it give me an error in the console? That's interesting. No, but I also don't think, I think only the first one runs. This might be an area where I'm wrong, um, which often happens on these streams. This is always a good time. So if I run this now, Oh, interesting. It's run. It's I maybe I'm wrong. Maybe we maybe I was part of this feature conversation. I would love to be wrong. Um, let's see if it really is uh, just concatenating and running all this code. So and presumably in page order. So if in my first we're learning real time here. If I have my first setup tag that defines foo to return hello, and I have my second setup tag that defines foo to return goodbye. We'll get rid of this print line down here. My expectation is that. When I run this editor, I will print goodbye, goodbye. Let's try that. It's bootstrapping. It's bootstrapping very slowly all of a sudden, and I'm not sure why. So it did return goodbye, goodbye, but that took like three times as long. Let's just, let's get rid of this second setup tag and see if that's a coincidence. It might be. Yes, I think that's a coincidence. Um... I think something else has changed in my condition, perhaps with the condition of my internet, to be honest, which is a little shaky at my new abode. Um, so, all right, so, so to ignore that, if you will. Um, but I'm wrong. You can you have multiple setup tags for one uh, one environment, and of course, you could have um, you could have a setup tag for each of your different editor environments, right? So, if I had uh, an environment called two, and in that uh, and in that environment's setup tag, I had the uh, foo function defined to return goodbye. What I would expect is if I run both of these in the first editor in PyDide 1, I should see hello, hello. And then the second, I should see goodbye, goodbye. Let's see if that's really true. Hello, hello, goodbye, goodbye. Perfect. Um, so you can, if you have multiple, say, examples or questions or quizzes on your page, and you need each of your sets of editors to have a different kind of setup code before it, you can use a different setup tag uh, to, to pre-run some code for your users before they get into your editors. Yeah? Cool. That is the setup attribute of the pi editor tag. Let us move right along. Hide that again. And I'm going to hide my console again. And I'm going to shrinkify this. Um, let's move right along to another new feature, um, which is uh, we have been expanding the 
uh, PyScript FFI. Uh, in other words, the, the set of functions that are available within PyScript uh, as a foreign function interface to do useful things with, right? To modify data, to retrieve data in a way that PyScript thinks will be useful to its users. So I'm gonna go ahead and put a source attribute back in my script tag, just to make it a little bit easier to work with the uh, Python code here. Um, and I'm gonna demo for you three different um, pieces of the uh, the Pyodide package, the Pyodide module that you might find useful. Um, starting with, which one did I want to start with? I wanted to start with, ah, fetch. Let's talk about fetch. Fetch is how you get data from an API on the internet. Um, and there have been, there are fetch methods that have been useful in PyScript before. If you're looking at older examples, you may see pyfetch from pyodide. You might see people importing fetch from JavaScript directly, but we figured this is a common enough use case that it deserves its own method, um, just called fetch, pyscript.fetch. So let's see how that's used. So I'm gonna do, let's just make sure that this demo code is running. Yes, I see hello world there. Um, and let's change that up a little bit. I'm gonna say from PyScript import display and fetch. Um, and uh, I'm going to do something that, that my, my editor is going to complain about. And then I'm gonna show you how PyScript doesn't care. Um, I am going to uh, fetch this using a wait at the top level. Um, so I'm going to say response equals fetch and then the URL of the API that I want to fetch from. And I'm gonna copy and paste in an example here that I stole earlier from a, a resource called RecRes, which is an open like API endpoint, which is really useful for testing. So I'm gonna grab some dummy user data just to have something that shows up um, on my screen here. Um, now, uh, one thing that uh, is required is that fetch is an asynchronous method. We have to await it. And this is the part where my browser, my, my editor starts complaining and says, await is only allowed with an async function. Um, and normally that is true, but I will show you in a moment how we get around that. Um, I'm going to first uh, output the results of this response and getting the uh, the JSON content of a, a fetch request uh, in on the JavaScript side is also a coroutine. It's also an awaitable. So we have to await it then. So I now have these two awaits that are hanging out at the top level of my module and VS Code is very sad. And in fact, if I just run this now without any further modifications, um, we'll see, well, we'll see my cheat sheet again. But in the meantime, we'll see uh, that, that uh, Python itself is complaining. It says you're using await outside of an async function. You're not allowed to do that. Await exists inside of it. coroutines, inside of async functions. What are you doing? And I will tell you what I'm doing. If I come back to my script tag and I make it an async script tag, that async attribute uh, makes top level await permissible inside of my Python code. So let me say that again. This does not make your code asynchronous. This does not prevent it from blocking the main page, right? If I do something like for i in range, I don't know, a million x equals zero and display done. Then I will sit and spin in this loop forever uh, without display. There's, there's nothing else happening on this page right now. I'm fully locked up um, because I'm running synchronous Python code, which this is. The async tag does not make your code asynchronous. What it does do is allow for top level await. Right, so that's that's all the async tag is doing is saying this this style of awaiting something at the top level is permissible inside an async tag, and we make you declare that explicitly because this is not okay in normal Python, um, but it's permissible inside of the context of an async tag in PyScript. Um, so you can see, I've, I've sort of buried the lead here, but you can see we fetched some data from our dummy uh, API endpoint. We got Janet Weaver's email address, uh, who has this avatar at this at this uh, um, URL, this JPEG here. And if I change the user to three and rerun this code, I should see, yes, we've got Emma Wong's email address and various things. Um, and this is the gist of how you use uh, fetch to get data from an API in PyScript. One of the reasons we wanted to move this utility into the PyScript package is that this works equally well in uh, Pyodide and in MicroPython, um, I think. Well, well, I guess we'll find out. What am I? Object of dict view has no type. Oh, it's complaining about displaying this JSON object. Yeah, okay, so this is a, this is a persistent issue. Um, let me see if it'll get 
the text. Yes, okay. So that's that's a bug that we are still currently working out, but if I, instead of fetching the JSON object, get the text object, we can see that now we are able to um, fetch the, the results in MicroPython as well, which is quite a bit faster to load, and then get the response and display it. Um, Let's see, I got a question here. Why is there no longer a gray loading screen in the newer versions? When I first tried in the 2024 version, I thought it's not working because the long loading time of PyScript. Yeah, so this is a really good question. So let's see if I can and do a demo for people who may not know what this is. Um, if I go back to a quite a bit older version of PyScript, like uh, 2023.5.1, and 2023.5.1 slash PyScript.js, and then this must be a defer, and then this has to be a PyScript tag. I'm, I'm, I'm dredging up the memory of old PyScript out of like the depths of my brain. Um, let's see what errors we get. I, I wanna show people who may not be familiar with what you're talking about, TubeWatcher, um, uh, what this is. Is it 05? Yes, there we go. Python startup. Oh, and I'm gonna need, did I get the CSS? I didn't. Maybe it was PyScripts.CSS? Yeah, there it is, okay. So yeah, so prior to version uh, 2023.11.1, PyScript had this loading screen, right? That was, it, but there was a lot of things that were true prior to that, the big rewrite that happened in 23.11. Um, and if, I, if you missed that, let me reload the page and you can see. So we defaulted to using this loading screen to communicate that PyScript was loading. And we have done away with that um, because we got basically as many people who said uh, we would like to, how do I hide that loading screen as people who are like, that your loading screen is really useful. How do I modify it? Versus now people like yourself who are like, well, now I'm, I'm confused because there's no visual feedback, right? And we couldn't figure out quite how to rectify all of those things together. We decided that the the sort of the the best option for PyScript in production is to not have visual feedback um, built into the package. That said, um, you can using the hooks mechanism, which is available in the documentation. It's maybe a little deeper than I want to try and do in my feet right now. Um, hook into PyScript's lifecycle and install your own loading screen. Um, so you could say, you know, when PyScript is first loaded, you know, install the CSS spinner on the page, on the page somewhere and, and give a message. And then when PyScript is done executing, um, remove that CSS or, or however you want it to put in a loading document. Um, so that, that was the compromise that we made because as people were starting to use PyScript for actual applications, um, the hard coded loading screen, um, was not the ideal solution, but I hear you that like, if you have, you know, if you're on especially a slower internet connection and Pyodide takes 15 seconds to initialize, it feels like nothing is happening. And that's a, that's a valid point. Um, and if you think that there is a better way that we can sort of parse this UI puzzle, um, I would, I would highly encourage you to come and either post uh, an issue on the GitHub or on Discord. Um, as always, know that like it's a can of worms that we've opened before, but it's it's never bad to reopen it to be like, hey, I know here's this you know Jeff said this thing on this stream, maybe it makes sense, maybe not, but in my use case, in my imagination, here's a better idea, or like I was confused by this, is there some way you can help? Um, so that's a, a kind of a wending way of 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 saying. As of 23.11, we made a different choice. Um, I would welcome further conversation on different choices. Hopefully that makes sense. Cool. Let me show off. Oh, here, let me reset my uh, my demo doc here. And let me show off a couple of other um, new bits of code in the FFI, um, in PyScript's FFI. Let me make this a little bit bigger. There we go. Um, and let me reload so I we get back into, <laughs> into modern PyScript here. Um, oh yeah, it's complaining about await outside of my function because that demo code is still the same. I will make that not an await tag, an async tag. Uh, and then it should fetch that just fine again. Um, the other two pieces of the FFI that I want to show off are 2JS and create proxy. And for those of you coming from the Pyodide world directly, these will feel pretty familiar, um, but we've moved them into PyScript for a couple of reasons that I want to talk about. Um, so let me pull up my uh, pre-written sample code over here to show why this is useful. Um, 
inside of my HTML here, I'm going to add a couple of things. Um, in my PyConfig, um, in addition to using that local interpreter, I'm going to make use of PyScript's ability to load um, JavaScript modules, ESM modules directly, and load in this Fireworks module um, directly into PyScript as a thing called Fireworks underscore module. Um, if you've not played with this feature, check out my last stream, I think, on the 1. Uh, 2024 1.1 version. Super cool feature for pulling JavaScript directly into Python. Um, but I'm going to pull it in to, to show you how the 2.js feature that we've added to PyScript makes this even easier to interact with. Um, suspect if I save this now, nothing will change because this is just part of the configuration. Um, I've added a canvas element up here, which is where our fireworks will appear. And then let's write our code to um, to actually make use of this. So I'll do uh, from PyScript import document, which grabs a reference to the main threads document, the, the DOM, the actual page itself. And that's true whether PyScript is running in the main thread or in the worker. Uh, I'm going to do uh, from PyScript.js modules dot fireworks underscore module, which is that name I created earlier, import fireworks, which is the default export from that JavaScript module. And then I'll import our new function from PyScript.ffi import to JS. Right. So the, the exact implementation details of the fireworks module are not super germane, um, but I will show you how, to, how it is used because it'll let us create an example. I'll say container equals documents dot query selector and give it the ID of oops, uh, query selector and the ID of that canvas we created earlier. So you'll see in this canvas up here, I've given an ID of FW for firework. Um, and then in, in my PyScript, I can grab a reference to that element using the query selector function. Um, then I'm going to create a new fireworks option. I'll do fireworks equals fireworks dot new container and fireworks dot start. And if all has gone well, I should get fireworks. Yay. Amazing. So this is literally what the fireworks uh, JavaScript module does is it it makes fireworks on the page. It's fun. Um, I love this as a, um, a teaching tool and examples tool because it's fun. It's really easy to set up and configure. Um, and it lets us poke around at like various ways you can configure it, which is what I want to do right now. So the fireworks object, the fireworks object constructor um, takes a number of options. And uh, this is one of the areas where Python and JavaScript tend to differ. If this was a Python um, well, uh, first of all, if this was a Python object, we probably wouldn't be calling this dot new constructor, um, but that's the way that you construct JavaScript objects from inside of PyScript or Pyodide. Um, so that's one difference. The other thing is in Python, you would often see something like, uh, you know, uh, fireworks. Um, and maybe you would say like hue equals, uh, 10 to 50 and delay equals 430 and, um, big equals false. Like we provide keyword arguments as a way of modifying our constructor when we make a new object. Um, in JavaScript though, the standard practice is to provide a configuration object, often just called options. Um, and this really does need to be an object. Um, this can't be a, a dictionary with your keyword arguments in it or something like that. This is looking for a, a literal object with certain properties and values. Um, the one I'm gonna play with today is hue. Um, which will be used for constraining the hue, the color of these fireworks as they appear. Um, so since this has to be an object, you can imagine like there are various ways that you could instantiate uh, an object that has the hue property and sets it correctly, right? You can do like class options, um, def init, um, uh, self dot he like this already I'm getting bored. Like already this seems like just to set some options on a single object that I'm creating. This seems like an awful idea. Um, so let's, let's, let me show you how using two JS will make this better. Um, what we'll do is where we want our, well, leave, let's leave that in there and we'll create our options object separately using pyscript.ffi.2js. And what we'll pass in is a dictionary or a nested dictionary um, containing uh, the keys of the object that we want to create. So in this case, the hue object takes a, uh, the, the options object can have a 
hue attribute, which is also an object, which should have attributes uh, called min and max, uh, which confine the minimum and maximum hue of the object. By wrapping all of that in pyscript.ffi.2.js, we basically take this dictionary structure and convert it to an object or a nested object with these properties. So now if I resave and reload, what I should see is that my fireworks are confined to basically be red and yellow, because that's the amount of hues sort of between hue zero and hue 30 on the color wheel. And we've constrained them to the minimum and maximum uh, uh, values here. I could actually I could constrain them to other things as well. I could say between 100 and 110 and reload that. Um, and now we're only in the sort of the green part of the color wheel. Um, the 2JS is necessary here because, again, if this is just a dictionary, JavaScript doesn't really know how to deal with Python dictionaries. It, it expects an object. So instead of getting an object with a hue attribute, what it gets is a dictionary with a hue key and says, well, a dictionary with a hue key doesn't have the attribute hue, so I'm not going to look for it. So that's why we wrap this in 2JS to turn it into an object um, and make it something that JavaScript can, can understand. So the 2JS function to sum up is the way that you turn Python, usually dictionaries, into JavaScript objects um, in a convenient way that JavaScript can use, usually for an options key or, or for something else. Make sense? Hopefully. I think this is fun. Also, the, the Excuse me. The fireworks uh, module is super fun to play around with, and I, and I use an example. So go go check that out as well. Um, it is literally just fireworks dash js. So that's a fun thing to do. The other part of the FFI that I want to show you um, is pyscript.ffi.createProxy. Uh, and this has a, some very specific use cases that it's, it's necessary for. Um, but I'll show you them now because they may be something that you need. So let us delete... Uh, some things out of our demo here, and I can get rid of our uh, ESM interpreter here. I can get rid of my canvas, um, and let us add a button to our page. I'll say uh, HTML element button that says click me, and we'll just put that around the page. Now, currently, click me does exactly nothing. Um, now, let's say you wanted to interact with this button via PyScript in some way. Well, the typical way to do it, and the way that does not require create proxy, is using the when decorator. I could say at when, with an action of click and a selector of button, run the decorated function, which will be passed an event object from the event. And I could say, maybe I'll, I'll bring in the display function as well. And I'll say when I click that button, display, hello world. Save that, initialize it, and when I click, I should get hello world. I actually get every time, every time I click it, I get hello world. And these are appearing, by the way, above the button because our PyScript tag appears before our button in the DOM. Maybe for convenience, I'll just put the button at the top so my button doesn't run away from me um, when, uh, when this is initialized. Hello world, hello world, perfect. Um, as a brief reminder of the second way to add interactivity um, to a, uh, a PyScript button, if I get rid of my when decorator, I guess I don't need document either, if I get rid of my when decorator in my button, in my HTML, I can say uh, button pi click equals foo and pass it the name of a callable in my interpreter. Um, and you'll see now that my interpreter is initialized, I can again click the button and it gives me the results of calling that foo function. Um, one nifty little usability feature here, you, you may have caught it or not, is when you have the pi click attribute on the page, the deck, the um, the element that it's on is disabled until the interpreter is ready to listen to that event. So if I reload the page here, you'll see this click me button go gray as it's disabled. And then as soon as the interpreter is ready to accept the event, it is it is enabled and ready to go. So um, depending on, yes, and you see if, I, if I, I've, I've clicked it, oh, it's interesting. I wonder what that error is from. That's from me clicking it before it's ready. Ah, okay. Another another bug that I can report upstream. But in any case, the button becomes re-enabled um, after um, uh, after the interpreter is ready. So I'm just gonna make a little note of that error on the side here and talk to Andrea about it after the stream, because um, that's a thing we should fix. Uh, error on pi event on disabled object. Um, so that'll be that'll be a thing. Okay, but we still haven't gotten to talking about why you need a uh, create proxy. Why would that be a thing? Um, so if you are doing, um, th there are other ways of, of assigning event listeners. And there's other contexts where create proxy is necessary, but event listeners is the big one. Um, 
And you could do something like this. Like I could bring in the document object, which again is representing the page. And I could define my foo function and I could say document dot get element by ID button. And let's give that button an ID of button. Um, and I could say dot on click equals foo. So this is another way of attaching event listeners to objects, both in JavaScript and in PyScript. You just assign to the on click function or the on mouse over function or on the on hover or on blur, on focus, you know, uh, the attributes will assign an event listener to that object. But I believe if I've done this right, ooh, ooh, it still works. Ooh, that's exciting. I was hoping this would break. All right, well, that works too. Uh, that's interesting. I didn't know that. Okay, well, that's another option for assigning event listeners. I wouldn't use this in preference of the other two. I would use the when decorator, but this may be useful for you in certain contexts. Um, all right, let's do a thing that really will break here. Um, get element by idea, add event listener, uh, click and foo. So uh, the add event listener, which is a JavaScript side function, um, takes in, again, an event name and a callable and hooks that up as an event listener on that object. And I believe, I believe this is broken. Yes, if I click on this, nothing is happening. And if I open the console, I believe I will see errors. Yes, a bunch of errors for every time I clicked. If I zoom that in a little bit, we have the dreaded uncaught error. This borrowed proxy was automatically destroyed at the end of the function call. Try using create proxy or create once callable. Um, set see more info in pydie.set debug. So this this try using create proxy is a hint to you of what to do. This message is actually coming from pydie, the C Python runtime. Um, they have a, a function called create proxy as well, which we've now wrapped and adapted into PyScript. So what the heck is happening here now? Why, why, Jeff? You've gone down all this way. Why? What? What is this error? And how do I fix it? And what is this create proxy thing? Well, what's happening here is this. Um, when I create in the middle of my Python runtime here, a callable called foo, an object, then I hook up that object as an event listener on the JavaScript side. But Python doesn't have any way of knowing that this JavaScript element maintains a reference to my function. Um, if it was a Python object, it would absolutely say, okay, well, something's referencing foo. I'd better hold on to that object and keep it alive then. But when we get to the end of this execution, Python says, well, nothing's referencing foo that I can see. I'm going to garbage collect it. I'm going to destroy it. Um, and that's what this error is trying to tell us. This borrowed proxy was automatically destroyed at the end of a function call. So this function call, in this case, is saying the entire evaluation of this script. It says, you know, I got to the end. I didn't see anything referencing foo. I destroyed it. Um, and the way that we help Python understand, no, 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 you need to keep uh, a reference to that around because something that you don't know about is referencing it. I can do from pyscript.ffi, import, create, proxy. Um, and there's a couple different ways of using it. One is just as a decorator, right? So you at decorate, create, proxy, right? This, I believe, will work. We'll find out if I'm wrong. I'll leave the console open so if we get errors, I'll see them right away. Click me. Yeah, there we go. We get hello world. Um, you could also uh, use it directly as a function. You could say foo equals create proxy foo, right? Which is the same thing as this decorator syntax, right? Decorators are just a, uh, a shorthand for this. So if I get rid of this and reload the page, once PyScript loads, I should see... Hello world works again. So create proxy is essentially an, an invocation to, to PyScript, to PyScript, to Python, to Pyodide, to say, trust me, you're gonna need to keep this around. Create a proxy for it and hold on to it. Uh, otherwise you're gonna put the user into some trouble. Now, the reason I would recommend, uh, so, so let me back up a step. This may solve problems for you. If you're getting um, this error about, you know, borrowed proxy was automatically destroyed because you're doing lots of event handling manipulation inside of PyScript, um, then this is one of the solutions is to do your own proxy management. That said, if you're just writing a simple script and you don't need to do active proxy management, I would always recommend doing the when's decorator syntax, um, which takes you know an event and a selector, rather than doing a more cumbersome like get element by ID and add event listener. This is going to treat you better. And under the hood, it's doing something very similar to this. There's no performance penalty for doing it this way. We just decided to sort of clean it up and make it more Pythonic to attach event listeners. So that's create proxy. It, it tells Python to hang on to a reference of an object 
even if it can't see that there are any references to it, um, because you'll probably need them from JavaScript. Yeah, cool. Hopefully that makes sense. Uh, cool. Ask questions if you got them, put them in the comments, put them in the chat. But in the meantime, uh, let's carry right along. Um, let's talk about, here's, this is a feature I actually, I set up to test and then didn't actually test before the stream. So we'll see if we, if we get ourselves into to trouble again. Um, but PyScript now has the ability to automatically unzip zip files for you when you bring them into your project, um, which is handy if you are um, bringing in lots of uh, data into your project or you have a build step that puts the data into a zip or a tar file. Um, this is just a convenience feature that people have asked for. So remember, the way that you bring files into your a uh, virtual Python interpreter, your, your in-memory Python interpreter to use them with PyScript is using the files key, which takes a URL and a as a key and a destination in the virtual file system as the value. So I have prepared ahead of time. You may not be able to see this, but I'll, I'll blow it way up so you can see. I have a text file called one.txt in my browser here. Uh, and it just says, it just says one. Isn't that fun? One fun. Uh, in my in my uh, in my local file path that's being served at a URL, right? So if I wanted to bring that text file into my uh, my environment where I can use it, I could say URL of dot slash one dot text, and I want to put it at the file path in my virtual environment of one dot text. I right, load that in. Oops, I've once again brought up my my cheat sheet instead of my actual window here. Sorry about that. The cheat sheet, by the way, is my own blog post on these updates. Um, it's one of the handy things about writing a blog is you get to be your own reference. Um, that is linked in the description. You can check that out if you'd rather. If you'd rather read all that, I'll read all of these things rather than listen to me blather about them. That's always an option. So now that I have added one dot text to my files key, what I should be able to do is uh, treat it like any other local file you would in Python. Let's say with open one dot text in read mode as f print f dot read all right we'll reload the page actually i should probably display it so it shows up on the html page and not in the console let's see and i get one fun yay um so that's that's basically how you move a data file into the into the browser where you know you or the user can interact with it um but you may also have seen when I zoomed in really big there, I had text files called one, two, and three dot text. Um, and I've zipped them all up into a text file uh, called, uh, to a zip file, sorry, called uh, text dot zip. So if I bring in text dot zip equals uh, text files slash uh, asterisk here. Um, oops, I get an error. I was a little afraid that would happen. What's this error? Error number, no such file or directory one.txt. Oh, it's just erroring because it's trying to open one.txt and one.txt doesn't exist anymore. I've stuck it inside of a folder. So I should be able to open one slash text files slash one.txt. And in theory, I should see one. Did I reset it to one? Oh, it's one, not one fun. Oh, interesting. Interesting, what's happening there? If I do f dot read lines, oh, that's weird. What happened? Why is fun not showing up? Oh, that's a weird. That's a weird bug. Um. Oh, oh, <laughs> I know what it is. No, it's not a bug. It's not a bug. Don't worry about it. It's when I created that zip file. I only had the file one saying one, and then I zipped it up. And of course, a zip file is not going to respond in real time to changes in another text file. Um, so if I if I open that that zip file, I don't know if it'll let me. Yeah, it's gonna be it's gonna be very sad. Yeah, so this is the contents of that zip file, which of course isn't changing when I change the text file. So that makes a lot of sense. Um, so what's happened there is that that zip file um, has basically been automatically unzipped into the local folder called slash text files. So now let's I can actually see all that. I could say import os, and I could say uh, display os dot lister dot slash text files. If I run that, I should see one, three, and two dot text have been moved into this text files folder. Um, and similarly, actually, if I just print my current working directory, I should see a folder called text files that's been created for me. So this is a little a little feature add that's been tacked on to uh, the files key, which is if you provided a file that ends in, I believe it's dot zip 
or dot tar jot dot tar dot d sorry dot zip or dot tar dot gz um, and the destination ends in an asterisk uh, then that zip file or that tarball will be automatically unzipped to that destination folder um, it seems like a little thing but we were getting users who were like hey i have 60 data files and i can easily you know put in a build step to say whenever i make a modification re-zip them up but then i have to still enumerate them all individually inside of my pyconfig and that's a real pain so now we have automatic unzipping for you built into the pyconfig files key um so there's that that's a fun feature i think Let's see, we're getting down into the final few features here and a lot of them are just quality of life, which is not to say that they're unimportant, they're really, really quite nice. Um, one thing that's true now, um, which you wouldn't think was, was such a hard thing to do, but it turned out to be quite involved, um, is we now have accurate line numbers in errors. Um, this turned out to be a little bit involved, um, but basically prior to, I think it was 2023-21, 2024-21, sorry, um, the line numbers that you'd get in your error messages referenced, it's not entirely important, but basically the, the line number would be nonsensical. Um, and now they're correct. So you can see on my demo.py file here, I have my zero division error happening on line five, um, and inside of my, um, my actual error message here, I, I see that exec on line five is incorrect division by zero. So that's a good feature. Um, what else have we got? So this is going to be, uh, that here's a feature that is going to be difficult to demo in this live environment. And I encourage you to go read the, the release blog post link below for the full explanation. But let me give you a conceptual overview of the idea of coresless workers. Um, and I'll show you the error that this works around. Um, you may have noticed that in um, in my sort of boilerplate here, before I keep hiding the head, I have this extra reference to uh, mini coi.js. And what that's doing is basically shimming in the proper headers that I need to run PyScript in workers. So you may know that if you add the worker attributes to a PyScript tag, um, and I, you know, maybe I don't want it to error. Um, uh, you can run your code in a worker thread and not lock up the main thread while your Python is executing. Really great feature. However, um, I think I'm going to have to comment this out and then go basically delete um, its effects from the browser. Yeah. So this is something that basically ends up being persistent, um, that shim. So if I go into my dev console, uh, application and service workers. You can see the service worker for mini COI has been set up. I'm gonna unregister that and it's gone. So now when I refresh, what I think I will see in the development console here is, um, yeah, one of our other favorite errors that we get questions about, which is uh, unable to use shared array buffer due to insecure environment. Please read requirements at MDN, um, which is not like, if you're, listen, I get it. If you're coming from the Python world, that error message might as well be in Greek. Although at least it has a, uh, a link to more reading in it. So let me just explain in 60 seconds what that is telling you. So uh, under the hood, PyScript, like a lot of uh, PyAdide and MicroPython based projects, um, makes use of a feature uh, of web browsers called the shared array worker to make this worker thread possible. It's how we provide a synchronization mechanism between what's happening on the page and the worker thread so that we can sort of transparently pass data back and forth. As of about 2018, uh, browsers no longer allow you to indiscriminately use the shared array buffer feature wherever you want in a web page, you can only use it when the server is providing specific headers that essentially declare this to be a safe environment to share memory in. Um, and so to do that, you as the, the web page creator or the PyScript offer need to either set up your server to provide those headers, which not everyone who wants to just like write a little Python is comfortable doing. Totally fair. I don't, I'm not totally comfortable doing it in every environment. Or you provide one of these shim JavaScript libraries um, that basically inserts a little, a little uh, service worker, a little mini application that shims in those headers for you, even if your server's not providing them. And the one I use is mini COI by J, uh, mini COI .js, um, which is provided by Andrea, who's one of our, our PyScript developers. Um, 
so that that basically is what this mini coi.js is doing here is allowing me to use um, workers and also you know things that rely on workers like the pi editor pi editor is a workers only feature um, so but this makes it pretty easy to implement you know basically say download download the contents of mini coi.js stick it in your server i mean there's you don't have to understand any of what this is actually doing um, you put it next to your document then serve it uh, into your HTML script and boom, workers pretty much just work. So easy enough there. Um, what uh, there are situations though, where either a, this is not permitted or B, maybe you already have another one of these service workers running because service workers can do a ton of different stuff. Um, I used the term shim for them earlier, and that is um, a pretty good description. They basically give the web developer the ability to say, hey, when the page tries to load something, um, maybe instead of hitting the web server directly, maybe do something else. Maybe serve from a local cache. Maybe, um, depending on some variables, they said maybe don't load it. Maybe load something else entirely. Um, if you have an offline web app or, uh, you know, a page that continues to work offline, um, a lot of that is down to the ability of service workers to say, okay, well, if I have an internet connection, load the most recent data. If I don't have an internet connection, load it from this local cache that I prepared earlier. Um, so service workers are super, super super versatile and valuable. Um, and there might be situations where you can't just throw a service worker at a particular problem to solve it. Like you might already have one and this one would conflict, or maybe your release environment doesn't allow you to even set the correct headers at all. Maybe you're, you know, you're running PyScript in a, a development environment and your DevOps team says, Hey, uh, you can't set those course permissions. That's against, you know, other things that we're doing. It's not our security policy. We can't do it. So that's an issue, right? Because we want people to be able to use workers where they can. Um, so PyScript 2023, 2024 3 one, I believe, introduced this concept of coresless workers. Um, and I will actually, here, I'll tell you what we'll do. We'll just bring in the blog post about it um, and zoom in so we can actually stand a chance of reading it. This is it, by the way, uh, jeff.glass uh, slash post. Let's watch new PyScript 2024 Q1, which is again, linked below. Um, and it talks about this issue. And basically there are a lot of people who would like to use PyScript who don't care about synchronizing with the main page at all. The shared array buffer functionality is there because it allows you to say, you know, do things like we did earlier and grab the document object from the page and do something with it or, uh, handle like pie click or, uh, you know, the when decorator that are interacting directly with the content of the web page. But if you don't need that, we don't really need as strong of a synchronization mechanism. Um, if you just want to say, you know, uh, when the user clicks this button, run this calculation in NumPy and then just hand me back, you know, an integer um, or something like that, or perform this web request and then do some processing of that data and hand it back to me as a, as a JavaScript object, we don't need as strong of a synchronization method. Um, and so you can basically disable the need to use a shared array buffer by setting a new option called sync main only equals true in PyConfig. This basically does two things. One, it prevents the worker from accessing the DOM of the main page, the contents of the page, which is a big restriction, but if you don't need it, um, you'd no longer need shared array buffer. So you no longer have to use mini COI or set your headers or what have you. Um, and this is to open up uh, the ability to use PyScript in numerical calculations or, or, or processing situations in ways that don't need the main page. So in a way that users no longer have to worry about cores errors or shared array buffers in that context. Um, so that's, that's the concept of, of, uh, of coresless workers. Like I say, uh, uh, because of the setup needed to demonstrate that going to be hard to do it correctly. Um, but I would encourage you to just go read the blog post. If this is an error that you're encountering or an issue that you think you would, um, you'd benefit from not having to worry about cores headers anymore. Um, that could be something that could help you out. Um, that is pretty much it, gang. That's all the major new features, um, as of PyScript 2024.4.1, uh, sorry, sorry, 2023. 4.3.2. Ooh, I gave the game away there. We are coming up on another release soon, uh, and I hope to be back doing another stream. You know, I had sort of condensed all the previous releases into this one big stream for Concision, but 2024.4.1 is going to be really exciting. There's some cool new stuff that's been added just in the past couple of weeks um, that I am so excited to talk about and show off. Um, there'll be at least one 2024.4 uh, release, maybe a couple, uh, with PyCon US coming up in early May. We're really pushing hard on some features and some documentation. Um, so that will be really cool to see. Um, and uh, 
Regardless, uh, I encourage you to join the PyScript Discord, uh, which has all the, the latest updates and lots of cool folks hanging out in it. Check out my blog, jeff.glass, which has the release notes on other PyScript information. Uh, and if you are coming to PyCon US in Pittsburgh in 2024, uh, I encourage you to come and say hi. I would love to meet you. Um, there are three talks about PyScript on Friday the 17th. Uh, mine is at 11 a.m. on uh, using PyScript to modify your existing documentation. Uh, Valerio has a talk uh, yeah, that afternoon about um, building a new interactive documentation system with PyScript, which I think those two will dovetail nicely together. And then uh, Lukash has a talk right after that about using PyScript to create 3D experiences directly in the browser in Python, which is super cool. Um, so if you're a Python on the web thread, uh, come and uh, come and say hi. I'd love to meet you. Ask questions. We will almost certainly have an open space and probably sprints afterward if you're sticking around. Um, and we will see you in Pittsburgh. In the meantime, I've been Jeff Glass. Thank you so much for joining me on this summary of what's new in PyScript in the first bit of 2024, and I will see you next time. Thanks, everybody. Now I gotta remember how I turn this off. Click a thing that says thank you. Then I mute my microphone. It's a whole thing. <laughs>